I'm going to be talking about some tips and tricks in debugging using Visual Studio. My contact information is on your screen. You can reach me at either Hotmail. I'm pretty active on Twitter. You can find out more about me in blog posts like this at my website below, or I stream three times a week on Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays typically, although I did stream for about two hours prior to this since I had about three and a half, four hours to kill between sessions. So that being said, a little bit about me. I'm a director of technology at Quicken Loans. I organize an event similar to this called Desert Co Camp in Phoenix, Arizona. We host about 900 people, usually in October this year. With everything that's happening, we kind of put that on hold. I am a Microsoft quote unquote developer services MVP. All that means is I do a lot of work for Microsoft and don't get paid for it. I'm also a Telerik Ninja, recognized by them for helping them out. It's kind of like their internal MVP award. But the more important stat is I am a father of two and husband to one, which means I am always broke and never right. So our agenda for today. Lots of debugging and no more slides. I'll probably pull the slides back up again for the contact information in at the end, but for the most part, we're gonna spend most day, most of the next 45 minutes inside of Visual Studio. So taking a quick walk through this app, this is probably the world's most complicated application in the world. It is a simple app that just lists out person information. So it has first name, middle initial, last name, email, date of birth, children, and then a function to return what would be the full name, depending on whether or not the middle name is, middle initial is applied or not. The actual program itself just goes and lists through all the different steps. If we run it, it's going to break right now. So that's kind of the mission. We're going to break the app as we go apart. But before we get started with digging into the app, let's start looking at some of the things that Visual Basic or sorry, Visual Studio has. Now, your settings might be different than what my settings are, as well as some of the shortcut keys and or the names. The short the names should be pretty close. The location might vary depending on how you set up your environment. The keyboard shortcuts will most likely be different unless you chose the Visual C sharp settings. If you're using VB, settings are slightly different. If you're using F sharp or one of the resharper settings keyboard shortcuts are different. I'll try to talk through each step as I use the keyboard shortcuts, but keep an eye in the middle of the screen. There is a plugin that I have that will generate and show you the shortcuts that I'm using. So for the most part, you can spend a good chunk of the time in this debug window. Now you notice that the debug window is relatively small now. As we're running the application, this kind of grows of what's visible, what's not visible. So let's take a walk through what some of these items are, and then we are going to actually uh, do them. First, you'll see the windows. There are four main windows that you'll use a lot when you are debugging. The breakpoint window, which we'll see in a little bit, the exception settings, which we might do, we might not do, but that essentially allows you to control which exceptions Visual Studio breaks on and which ones it doesn't. The output window, which you've probably seen many, many times. The show diagnostic tools, which will appear once we're running the app. And then the immediate window, which we are going to use a lot of. So here we have two different windows. Start debugging and start without debugging. One is F5 and one is Control F5. So a lot of people always wonder, what's the difference between the two? One of them, like it says, starts the code with debugging. And what that means is Visual Studio is what's called attaching to your program and watching each instruction and syncing it up with the source code. 
The other says it's just running the app. So you can think about it if we go and look at our folder in here where everything sits, there is a bin and OBJ folder. The OBJ is a throwback from the uh, C++ days. That writes out all the object files that ultimately get combined into your executable. The bin folder is where everything happens. You have two different folders in here, sometimes more depending on how your application is configured, and we'll walk through that in a little bit. But for the most part, you out of the box, the defaults are debug and release. If we navigate into one of them, you'll see a couple of different files. In this case, the mastering debugging.exe, which is the executable name for this. Then the .config, which is the app config for this file. This is actually written in .NET Framework, so it uses the app config versus app settings, but everything else is still the same. Mastering debugging.pdb. PDB stands for Portable Database. If you look at it, it says Program Database. Depending on who you talk to, the name kind of changes, but it used to be called Portable with the Portable Libraries. Essentially, this is what Microsoft uses or Visual Studio uses to debug your application. Then there are these two other sets of programs. Same name, but .vshost.exe, .vshost.exe.config, and .vshost.exe.manifest. These are the files that Visual Studio actually runs when you execute your application. It does what's called attaching to it. So VS Host kind of does all the, the magic behind the scenes of connecting the application with Visual Studio. And I'll show you how we do that in a little bit. Uh, the PDB file kind of links all the source code. So you notice here there's no source at all. All the source code is one level, actually two levels up in the folder structure. This PDB file contains essentially a database with the source code. So when you're going line by line in Visual Studio, the application Visual Studio is actually using this database as a reference to display it. And the VS host kind of links all that together. So that is really the difference when you do start debugging and start debugging or start without debugging. If I just run this, it's going to run the mastering exe without me attaching to it. And the other is start debugging without uh, with the debugging. Another way of doing that is doing the attach to process. You're going to skip over the performance profile and relaunch performance profile because those are only available in certain editions of Visual Studio. The attach to process allows you to connect to any process that is running on your machine natively. And it does that, this using what's called the Windows debugger. Uh, it kind of looks at every exe that's running. As you can see, I have an Amazon Music Helper running, uh, application frame host, which is settings. So apparently I have my settings open somewhere. And then 17 copies of visuals or Visual Studio Code Insiders, even though I only have one, it just runs so many processes. Docker running and a bunch of other things. So at any point I can click on this, let's say I wanna debug Microsoft Edge, I can click on it and choose attach and it will put a debugger attached to it. I won't be able to do much work for it because I don't have the source code, but if there's any weird exceptions, I can look into it. This is also helpful if let's say you have an app deployed somewhere on your network and someone is complaining about an issue using uh, the Excel spreadsheet generation where they can't open a file. If they're on the network and the firewall ports are not blocked, you can actually navigate by going to a target. So if you have the user's 
computer name here, let's say Sally Admin. If that's her computer name, you can click Find, and then it will go through and list all her applications. So you can actually debug it on that machine without hosting Visual Studio. Uh, do, 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 what else? We're going to cover step over and all these in a second. There's nothing in the... Oh, so when I talked about in here where we have a build and release, these are called build configurations. So if you go to the build menu and do configuration manager, this has this is where you go and edit those settings. So by default, it usually comes with two. You can create a new one. Typically, you'd have something like UAT, et cetera. And these allow for certain things to happen uh, in the old Visual Studio in .NET Framework. That gives you the ability to have multiple configuration files. Same thing happens with .NET Core. But the key difference is that between build config for debug and build config for release is uh, a set of files is not sent. So if we look at our debug window, we have six files sent. The three mastering debugging and then the three with the VSO. So if you look at the release, we only have three of them. It doesn't have the VS host. It still creates that because you can technically debug locally. When you're deploying your application, you should never ever deploy this file because that essentially has your source code in it. You technically can't read it for the most part, but I'm sure there are tools out there that allow you to do that. So let's go about debugging our application. First point in debugging an application is typically creating a breakpoint. A breakpoint signifies to Visual Studio that whenever this line of code is touched, I want you to stop everything and let me know. So there are a couple of different ways to put a breakpoint in here. The most common way is tapping right around the line number, tapping right around the line number. And it's hard to do it because I have all these plugins that are getting in my way. Or hit the F9 key, which is what I like. To, oh, it's in the column, not in the line number. That's why. So this says as soon as I hit start, to stop at that application. So if I click start here or hit F5, you notice this is a drop down that has just the options for start. I can set the release environment, which says I want us to run the release. I'm going to do everything in debug. And then I hit F5 to start it. Visual Studio builds. And now hit this breakpoint. So now on my screen, it's this nice big yellow line that has a feature here, which tells me that the application stopped. So it has this little yellow arrow with the right circle. If I hover over it, I'll see information like programs, program.cs, which is the file I'm in. I'm on line 13 at character. There's 16, so it's all the way to here. Uh, you'll notice a couple of other things. I have some plugins on my computer that add some extra stuff, like these icons. You won't necessarily have those. So now while I'm at this breakpoint, there's a couple of different things I can do. I can start and doing what's called stepping. So if you notice up here, on my screen, I have a whole bunch of new icons, mostly this bar here, that all have extra things that I can do. The most common ones are these here. And if you're using Visual Studio 2017, these icons changed a little bit 
in 2019, but we're going to explain them in a minute. We go to our debug. You notice the window is a lot bigger now, a lot more into play. We have the continue option, which says, OK, continue where you are and keep going until the next breakpoint. Stop debugging pretty much stops us where we are. It kills the application. It doesn't complete running. Detach all means remove the Visual Studio debugger and then let it run. Terminate all just kind of detaches, stops it, and ends the application. Uh, now we have these step backwards, step forward, step into, step over, and step out. We're going to cover these others in a little bit. So let's explain some of them. You'll see that there are icons up here. So step backwards goes back one step before. So since this is the start of the application, it's really not going to go anywhere. Step forward moves it one step forward. So the next line of code forward. Step into, step over, and step out relate to functions. So if we look here, this is a function called populate people, technically a method. So if I want, I can step into it to move the debugger into that function slash method. Or I can step over it saying, execute all that code for me and just get me to the next line, which is line number 15. So if I hit step into or press F11, you notice now my arrow moved and I'm now at line 29 which is inside of this method. And here, we are going to create a new instance of the person object, essentially for them, me, my wife, and my two children. Now, if I want, I say, oh, I looked at this method. I don't have to worry about it. I can choose the step out, which says execute the rest of the code and come back here. So now that we're here, I can go, and I'm just going to do step over and get our next thing and ignore this little guy for a minute we're going to come back to him now i'm ready to go i can hit continue and execute the rest of our application which stopped at one point the reason why it stopped is because on line 19, we have a read line. And I did that on purpose because I want you to see what happens next. We're going to get an exception now. So this is what we're going to work on. How do we go and figure out this exception? Well, there are a couple. The main reason for this exception is the argument out of range exception. So if you notice, when we created the people, there are four of them. In this code here, the line that failed, which is green, we tried to access the sixth, technically seventh index item in there. It's index item six, which is the seventh in the array for first name, but that didn't exist. So here you get the must be non negative and less in size of collection. But the reason why I did that is to show a couple of different things. We can click on the view details, which shows us, ooh, may want to zoom in full screen on that one, a quick watch window, which kind of shows us everything that's in here. So right now we're looking at the exception. So this tells us everything that's happening within our app, well, almost everything that's happening within our app. Here it tells us the main exception is index out of range exception. And then there's a bunch of properties with it. And you can navigate through all the properties. Here I can see data. I can go look through and see expanding results. You could ignore that, but that's usually used if you're using lists and things like that. The main thing you always want to look for is the inner exception and the message. This is pretty clear what happened. I put in a number larger than I should have. Uh, the other thing you can do is, let's say you know about this error and you actually want to try 
and ignore it. Visual Studio is always going to break on these exceptions. You can open up the exception settings, which appears here, and you can tell it to not stop on these sections. I want to test my code is actually working. So you see here I have a try catch. I want to make sure that the catch is working. In this particular case, it's a generic exception on line 23. So it doesn't really doesn't really warrant the user case, the use case that I'm saying. But at the same time, we can go and look at it. So here is a list of all them. You see that there is a check mark next to system dot argument out of range exception, meaning I want you to break whenever that exception is thrown. If I uncheck this, it's no longer here that this checkbox became unchecked. So if I click it again, now this checkbox is checked or vice versa. And I could also do it only from this application. So if I want to validate it here, now I'm going to stop the application and restart it. I hit play and we have our breakpoint there. Hit continue, hit enter, and it's done <laughs> because there's no corresponding console that right line. So it came here and wrote out the exception. So what I really should do here is put a console.read line, which indicates that um, it worked. So I hit start and I hit continue. As soon as I hit enter, we get our argument failed. Hit enter again, the app ends and goes away. So that's a good way of showing us how to do that. And you can get that at any time by going to debug, windows, exception settings. And I want to remove that condition because I don't. I don't want to forget that I had it on there. <laughs> so that's the first part. So we looked at how we can create a breakpoint and how we can step in, step out. But you can do more than just create the breakpoints. You can actually label the breakpoints and hit conditions with them. So I'm going to take out this breakpoint and I'm going to add another one here. This one, I want to figure out why now let's comment out this now so we know that that's going to break. Uh, let's say we want to break on the user Emily. For some reason, she's causing trouble. And if you know my daughter, you know that she's causing trouble. But she's all the way at the end of this list. I don't want to have to keep hitting continue, continue, continue four times to get to her, I'd rather Visual Studio be smart enough to get to it. And if you can imagine having a record set where you're going through 5,000 records and you want, you know it fails at record 4,990, hitting F5 to continue 4,990 times would be a pain. So here, if I hover over this, you'll notice that there are two buttons, settings and disable. Disable keeps the breakpoint there, but it doesn't actually break on it. Uh, that allows you to keep a history of the breakpoints and only turn them on when you need it. The other is the settings, which populates here. This allows us to create conditions and actions. So I'm going to create a condition. The condition is very similar to a Boolean expression. Uh, you can do hit counts, filters, or conditional expression. Hit count would be used how many times has this uh, piece of code executed. In our current example, I can do four to get it for to break on Emily's name, or I can do a conditional uh, breakpoint and say when it's true, I want 
uh, person, you see I get IntelliSense with it, person dot first name equals to Emily. And then I can also add actions to it if I wanted to. I can send a message out there and just stop. So this says, maybe I just want to know what her ID is or what her email address is. This allows me to do that. I'm not going to set the action right now. You'll notice now that over here, it's now changed to a plus sign, which tells me that there's a condition in there. So if I hit start, it's going to, and you can't see because the window disappeared so quickly, only print the first three names, me, um, my wife, and my son, who are the first three in the list. As you can see, me, my wife, and son. And Emily stopped. Now, if we look at Emily, oh, I forgot to... Uh, if we look, we can see details about Emily, but how do we go about seeing those details? If you click over the person, you can expand on it. Ooh, I want to break because I have something highlighted that I shouldn't have highlighted yet. Now, if I hover over person, I'm going to get a mastering debugging dot person. I can open it up and then see details about Emily. I can see uh, she has no children. Her date of birth was 531-1999. Her email address is this, first name is that, etc. And her full name is that. You notice there's a little magnifying glass here, <coughs> excuse me, with a drop down list. This allows for what's called visualizers. By default, it's smart enough to detect what kind of visualizers that is. And what that does is kind of displays it in the ID differently. So if I just click on that, it's gonna display as a text with just this text box. But if this was uh, a JSON document, let's say, and I did this to JSON, it's going to try to visualize it in JSON and tell me that the value is not a valid JSON document. You also notice that everything is in quotes in here. This gives me the ability to actually change a value. So I can call her Emmy, which is what I call her from time to time, hit enter and it updates the value in that object to Emmy. As you notice, the full name property changed because it realized that there was a change to the first name. If we go look at the person object, the full name takes the first name and last name if the middle initial is null. If the middle initial is not null, it builds out first name space, middle name period, and then last name. This, however, does not change the object that this came from a database. It does not update the corresponding database. It just updates the value for it in, in memory right now. So if this was actually pulling from a database and let's say line 18, I saved it, it would then save the new value which is Emmy. Well, that's up. We're going to look at another thing that we can do called uh, data tips. So if you noticed here, I hover over it, I get this little person display. There's a little magnifying pin right here, which might be hard to see. Let's see if I can if I zoom in on it. It might show... Yeah, there it goes. There is a pin there. If I hover over it and hit the pin, it creates what's called a data tip. This data tip now shows every time we're in here and I can open it up and I can pin something. So I can pin her name. Now, if we restart the application, so I'm gonna hit play, start again. 
you'll see that that value is there. If I hit a break point here, let's say I wanted to start over, I can come back here and choose, um, where is it? Set next statement, which pulls us all the way back to here to re-execute those lines of code. And if you see here, this is now grayed out in the cash value or the value from the last session. So if I hit function 10, or I actually hit function 11, which is not what I wanted to do. So let's hit function 10, hit function 10 again. And now if I break point for each one of these, you'll notice as soon as that person value changes, it's saying red because the value is different. Now I run it and it's telling me that the person dot full name was different from the last value. That's why it's showing up as red right now. Hit it again. It's gray because that's the last value. Step through it. It's it's turning red because it's saying that, hey, there's a change coming. Hit that, and we now have a new value. These are cool, too, because you can kind of move them around. I can click and drag and move that. I tend to put them, like, right next to where they are. You can also expand them and add a comment to it saying, you know, displaying the first name or displaying the full name. This is if you want to see that there's a problem. But the real value is not for you to see the full name. The real value comes in that you have the ability to export these. So you can go to debug and export data tips. And this will allow you to create an XML file that anyone with this solution can re-upload and have those same data points. So think about it in that previous example I gave with the 5,000 records. Let's say you were trying to figure out an issue with record 4,990 and you're about to go on vacation or holiday. You can set these breakpoints, hand it off to the other developer that's covering for you said here's everything I got here are here are the data tips that I was using to help me figure out that problem which is a neat little feature cool thing is you can do the same thing with breakpoints too so if we go here we can do toggle breakpoints new breakpoints which we've seen but if we go to windows there's a lot more windows now than there were before. We have our breakpoint window exception. So these four were here before, but now we have task, parallel, parallel watch. We're going to walk into the watch, autos, local, and immediate now. The others are really dependent on uh, what you're doing. Task, parallels, and parallels watch. These are if you're using the parallel task library or asynchronous uh, async code. This allows you to debug those. Skip over these for now. We're going to show you in a minute. DOM Explorer, if you're debugging a uh, web application, this will show you the document object model. Live Visual Tree, Live Property Explorer, these are for WPF applications. Call Stack will show you in a couple minutes. There's a bunch of windows on the bottom. Modules really don't use. This is more for C++. IntelliTrace is beyond the scope of this. This is only available in the enterprise editions of Visual Studio, so I typically don't cover it. Processes will show you any running processes on the machine. That's similar to the attach. The next three are for assembly language code. So let's view our breakpoints window for a second. So you see this list out every breakpoint we have in the application. Right now it says we have a conditional one in program.cs on line 17, character 21, which is right here. That says when person.entity equals Emily is true, break. Hit count currently one. It means it's the first time it's actually 
encountered this because there's only one person named Emily in this list. I can create new breakpoints here by doing a function data point. And this is really hard. You actually have to know the syntax for it. And I only know because I'm looking at it right now and typing it. And I think this would be 16. I didn't get this syntax right. That's why it's there. Let's see what it says. Ah, I was off by one character. <laughs> so you can manually type it if you want, but I never recommend doing that. Uh, you can delete any breakpoint from here. If you uncheck it, that does the disable that we talked about before. This will delete all breakpoints that meet the conditions. That's everything in here, although I can narrow it down to only, say, line 19. It's only showing this because there's only one project. If I did something like this here and did a breakpoint on that, I can narrow down the search to anything that has the word first name in it or anything with program whatever I want. So anything in the window I can delete. Export and import is the same as the data points. I can export all my breakpoints from here and share them with the developer. This looks like the same as the data tips. It'll give me an XML file that I can then go and share with others. So that's enough of breakpoints for a little bit. While the application is stopped, let's look at a couple of neat little things. There's a bunch of windows on the bottom that I have open. The first is the error list, which unfortunately every developer is familiar with. This is where you have all your build errors. Output shows us the output. That's from the build output. Uh, you can see different output windows here. Uh, lots of different applications can write to here. In this case, I'm highlighting the Git provider writes output to here. Uh, but for the most part, I don't use that window at all. The media window allows you to execute code in your browser or check for variables. So I can do person dot first name and it'll tell me what the current person's first name is in this case it's Deirdre uh, but really no one ever calls her that so I can actually go in the immediate window and change that so I can set her first name to D which is what everyone calls her and you notice once I did that it went and changed here because if we open up the person we have the person D and the first name changed because that was different from the previous value. Even if I change it back and do person dot first name equals D E I D R E, it's still going to be red because it's a change from the previous version. And you can do pretty much anything in here with the exception of some link statements. So I can go and add to this list. I can do uh, people.add new person. I won't do that because that's going to throw an exception because we're inside of the for loop now. But you get the drift. I can do almost anything. Call stack shows us where we are in the application. So I'm going to stop this for a second and then play it with the breakpoint that, oops, I removed the other breakpoint. I'm going to stop it for a second. I'm going to add a breakpoint here. Now, if I look at the call stack, you see there are two items in here. There's Populate people, line 31, which is where I am now. And then uh, submain. 
I just noticed that my class name is spelled wrong. Huh. I have to fix that. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Submain, which is where it came from. So it says, essentially, we got to line 31 and populate people from the main method, line 13. So if we double click on that, you'll see it gives us a light green that tells us this is where we came from. The icon also looks a little bit different in the screen. <coughs> there is a little, where'd you go? There's a green arrow that says, we're kind of stepping into this. That little blue push pin is because we have something pinned right here. So that's the call stack. It lets you see where you are. I'm going to continue and talk about the locals window and the watch window. While well, I get a drink since I'm getting very dry. The local windows in Visual Studio tries to give you all the relevant variables that are in scope for your application at the point in time that the code is running. So here on line 17, it knows that I have access to the people, person, and the args, since that's the only items that are available to me. So I have all the same ability that I had before. I can go see a person, I can list them all, I can go and change Emily's name to Stinky, because that's the other name we call her, and then it updates it the same way everywhere else. Uh, what I mean by the scope is, let's say I created a variable here called var first name equals person dot first name. And we're not going to use that variable in here, and let's just take off that for now. Click start. Now, if I look at the variables now, I see first name in here. When I navigate away from this, let's do a step over. Now you'll notice person and people are no longer there because they're no longer in scope. This line that we're on right now, a line 20, doesn't have access to a person anymore or the first name. It only has access to people and arguments. Now, the watch window is super similar, except differences with the watch window is you can put in what variables you want to know about. So if we restart our application, which is this little button here. I say, I want you to always tell me the person first name, person email address, and person last name. Um, I can also add anything else. Since I got the first name field now, I can add the first name. And that gives me the ability to see whatever I want. And just like the other places, I can go and change this anywhere I want. The last thing I want to share with you while we have a couple minutes is you notice uh, if we are in the person, when I hover over the person, I get this long, boring, mastering, debugging dot person. And then I have to go and open up and click on it to see each thing and then potentially pin whatever values I want. That's kind of a pain. Uh, there is something called the debugger display attribute, which allows you to customize what is displayed here. So I'm going to click stop. And then I kind of hinted to this before because I had it running. If we enable this debugger display attribute, which is in the system diagnostics class, you can use string interpolation to control what's displayed in here. So I can do full name, and I should have IntelliSense. I don't know why it's not showing. 
and saying date of birth. I only want to show the minute, the number of children they have, and the children dot count. So now if I hit play, now you notice when I hover over a person or I look at the person, I get the fully qualified list. In this particular case, the number of children for Emily is a null entity, meaning it's not set. That list is not set because she doesn't have any. But Visual Studio doesn't destroy your application or doesn't break it. It just tells you that there is a problem. And we can verify that by removing the conditional breakpoint and looking at myself. So now you see that I have one child listed, even though it technically should be two. So we got to figure out why that's happening. Uh, and the, you know, my time of birth and everything else. So this is a really handy tip to uh, get you through some debugging. And that's all I have for you now. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. My contact information is here. If you are interested in learning more about that debugger display attribute, check out my website here and search for debugger display and you'll get a whole article around that. Being said, that's all I got. And just in time too.